Hello, I'm Tom Medlin, W5KUB, and I'm with our co-host tonight, Ted Randall, WB8PUM. Welcome to the Amateur Radio Roundtable. Today is Tuesday, June the 23rd, 2015. We thank you for joining us tonight, and if you are listening by shortwave on WTWW, you can join in on the video webcast by going to W5KUB.com. Also, those watching the show can also listen in on 5085 kilohertz. Uh, Ted, how you doing tonight? Let's get a mic check on you. I'm, I'm doing okay. Doing a little tweaking here with the uh, uh, transmitter remote control, make sure that we got everything on. I don't think it's on right now. Okay. All right. Well, uh, uh, I'm, t I'm doing a little tweaking here, too. Uh, we put a little bass in here for you. And our guest tonight is going to be uh, Dr. Rick. And uh, let me just go ahead and introduce him while Ted is making some adjustments here. Uh, this week, our, our guest is going to be uh, Dr. Richard Olson, N6NR, of Taiton, Washington. He can tell me in a minute Tyaton. if I pronounced it. Did I get that close enough? No, you can tell you ain't from around here. It's Taiton. Taiton. Okay, <laughs> Taiton. Okay. Well, Dr. Rich has been an amateur radio operator like me for over 50 years. We both got our license just about the same time. Uh, and we're going to be discussing a wide, wide range of uh, amateur radio topics tonight. Uh, talk about the old days is where we're going to start off. Uh, and uh, we're going to talk about, you know, back then we even built our own equipment. But some of uh, Dr. Rick's background includes, which I think is a neat story, is his, uh, his friendship with uh, Senator Barry Goldwater uh, when he was 16 years old. Uh, Dr. Rick took an assignment with uh, uh, to man Barry's station and run phone patches to uh, Vietnam in the 1960s. Now, we probably have a lot of uh, viewers on or, or New Ham zone, uh, you know, uh, that, that don't know who Barry Goldwater was. But uh, uh, Barry was a senator and a very famous uh, uh, ham. And uh, you might want to look him up uh, a little later, maybe after the show there. Uh, Dr. Rick also served in the U.S. Navy. Uh, he's a Vietnam veteran. Uh, we're going to look at some of his antennas on a nine-acre uh, counter pose. He's got a counter uh, pose that's uh, got, got antennas above it. Uh, that makes him have a great signal there. He's a, a technical advisor uh, uh, for the ARL headquarters. Uh, he, his position is uh, evaluating manuscripts in uh, QST, QEX, uh, he's been, he was uh, several years on the editorial staff of 73 Magazine until it, it ceased publication. And, that wasn't my fault. And he's assuring me that it wasn't his fault. We'll have to verify that. Hey, he's done a little bit of everything. Hey, we're going to talk about Bluegrass Gospel Group he was with. Uh, and uh, uh, for another old name in ham radio, for you young guys, you may not know it, but Wayne Green, Wayne Green of 73 Magazine. We're going to talk about Dr. Rick here getting Wayne Green to sing with the Swept Wing Chicken Thieves. That's going to be a good story, so uh, stand by for that. He's had uh, uh, several highly technical careers, uh, with the last being a project engineer designing and building public safety communication systems in Washington and Oregon. And this guy doesn't, doesn't slow down. Would you believe it? He was a tenor. Uh, with the Seattle Opera. Well, I got some pictures, I think, in a minute that will surprise you there. So, how are you doing here, Dr. Rick? Hello there, everybody. What an honor it is to be with the both of you, uh, Tom and Ted. I'm a, I'm a devotee of, of your craft and uh, always appreciate uh, uh, what you guys are doing. And uh, just to be on this program is just, it just tickles me to death. Well, we enjoyed having you, and I'm glad I ran across you on one of the uh, Facebook groups. And uh, I, I think uh, your experience and the story you have tonight is, is going to be very, very interesting to uh, uh, to talk about. So, uh, Ted, you got all the little knobs adjusted and everything there? We should be on. Okay. So somebody can give us a signal report, check it out, see how we're, how we're doing somewhere. Now, you got to set up for high fidelity and all that? Stereo. Okay, stereo. Good. <laughs> Surround. I, I hope you're splitting. That's where you put a shortwave radio to your back and one to your front. Yeah, I hope you're splitting our signal for those channels there. <laughs> oh, man. Okay, well, hey, let's, uh, let's jump back here with Dr. Dr. Rick there. And, uh, uh, hey, uh, Dr. Rick, let's talk about 50 years ago, man. That seems like a long time ago. 
how did you uh, how did you even get started in ham radio? Well, actually, I started uh, much before that, and uh, in fact, there's a lot of young men and women that uh, did start this way. Back about 1958, my uncle gave me a shortwave receiver, which, by the way, I still have upstairs, and it still works. It's an old uh, Holocrafter's SX100, and uh, so I started out as a shortwave listener, and uh, when I uh, went to uh, school uh, at Scottsdale High School in Scottsdale, Arizona, I was influenced by two uh, mentors. One was Charlie Page, W7GEZ, who was a communications engineer from Maricopa County Communications. And then our uh, science teacher at Scottsdale High School, Cecil McGurr, W7UCO, the undercover operator. And between those two guys, why well, I couldn't resist uh, finally uh, buckling down, learning the code, and getting my novice license and becoming a ham. And, uh, I'm grateful to those two men. Uh, they've gone to their eternal reward since then. But, uh, wow, they had a tremendous impact on my life uh, because amateur radio basically set the groundwork for my professional career, at least the career that uh, paid the bills. Well, uh, it, it did for me, too. And uh, like you, I think we started, uh, we both got our license within about the same time period. Uh, like you, I started out being a shortwave listener. And that's where I got my start, just listening to all the old shortwave stations, uh, stations, you know, like Radio Moscow and Havana, Cuba. And there's one that uh, we were talking about, HCJV, uh, HCJB. And uh, I remember that station very well. And you, you're going to talk about some experiences with that station in just a few minutes. Uh, so uh, you were a shortwave listener. What, what kind of shortwave radio did you have back then? Do you remember? Yeah, yeah, I just as I met, just mentioned, uh, it was a Holocrafter's SS, SX100, and uh, that eventually became my novice receiver, and, uh, and that darn thing is still, it's upstairs in storage. Every once in a while, I plug it in and turn it on, and it still works. Well, I, I tell you, you know, I, that was, uh, yeah. go ahead, I was going to say, that was one of my very first receivers, was an SX100, that later I got a 101. But that 100, boy, that was a magical uh, receiver. I really love that thing. Well, you know, I had uh, I had an old Zenith. It had a big round five or six inch dial in the center, you know, with all the shorey bands on it, and weighed about 400 pounds. You know, the big cabinet that stood about four feet tall. That's what I started out on. I, I don't know if this will show up on camera, but I got a picture, and and you can tell me if you can spot that SX. I don't know if they, if this will show up here. Let me see. Let's see, let me get you full screen, Ted. There we go. To the uh, to my to my left in the picture. Can you see the oh, one there it dial? Is. I see yeah. it. There it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Ted, Ted, is that you? Is that you? Yes, that was me when as a as a as a younger person. That that does not look like you. I'm gonna have to verify that. Yeah, I've, I've accumulated a lot since then. But the I, I, when he said that, I just thought I, I you know SX100 is a, such a classic. Hallicrafter's receiver. The radio with the droopy eyelids. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, so, hey, you started out as a shortwave listener, and then uh, I, I guess you had some very supporting parents, maybe, to let you get into ham radio and string wires everywhere. And Did they help you out? Yeah. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, they were very supportive because the alternative was to me, you know, running around and running around town and messing up and being a wild kid. So they always knew where I was and what I was doing, and so they were quite grateful. Well, that's uh, that's cool. Uh, in my little town of about a 1,000 people, uh, my parents were the same way. I, you ran around during the day, and you came home, you know, by nighttime, and there really wasn't any trouble there. And and by getting helping me get into ham, ham radio, uh, I guess it, uh, it it really helped to, to keep people out of trouble there. Um so okay, so let's see. Let's move on here. I I've got a uh, I've got a bunch of pictures from you. There's no uh, certain way to, to start here, but I'm gonna pick a picture out here and let you tell us what it what it is. Okay. Now, first of all, all right. I, first here's a newspaper article right here. I don't know if you can tell me about that or not. Oh, that is from the Scottsdale High School newspaper. <clears throat> the uh, the name of the paper was the Scottsdale Beaver. And uh, that person to my that's in the left of me there in the picture 
is Elliot Klein. And those of you in the broadcast industry might know uh, Elliot, Elliot Klein. Unfortunately, he's left us uh, a few years ago. He passed away. But uh, Elliot was uh, started his career on broadcast stations in the Phoenix area and later on became a broadcast engineering consultant. Uh, very, very well known, highly professional. And uh, the two of us were, were like peas in a pod. Uh, there and uh, that's back in the back of the uh, the science uh, classroom there at Scottsdale High School, and that was an old SX twenty eight A receiver and a uh, DX one hundred transmitter, and the call sign of the station was W seven LXY Lima X Ray Yankee, and uh, well, Mr. McGurr was our uh, was our mentor. <clears throat> now you look a little older here. Yeah, I, well, you skipped right past that picture of me at the Maricopa County EOC. There we go, right there. That was, uh, by the way, those are not my cigarettes. Um, okay. That uh, That is the station, uh, the part of that station anyway. Uh, uh, that was all equipment that was owned by Maricopa County uh, uh, Racies. And uh, to my right was the is the Racy's officer. All I don't remember his name or his call sign. I just remember that uh, his day job was that of a dentist. And uh, but uh, uh, with a freshly minted general class license, here I am operating Collins equipment. And boy, that was just like getting behind the wheel of a Rolls Royce back in those days. Now. Uh, you were you were around 16 years old there. This is about the time you uh, met Barry Barry Goldwater, wasn't it? That's right. Uh, how I met him uh, was I was a member of the Scottsdale Amateur Radio Club. WA7APE was the call sign of the club. We had our own club station, and I attended uh, a lot of the meetings. And I I attended one of the meetings. And I was sitting right down in the front row. And lo and behold, who should walk in to give a presentation was uh, K7 UGA himself. And what he was doing, he was um, recruiting for operators to come and run phone patches from his house. This was before all those mo major modifications were made to his station. It was basically all his equipment. And, uh, <clears throat> and uh, so he gave his pitch and all that kind of stuff, and he says, now, do I have any volunteers? And I raised my hand up, and I said, yes, sir, I'd like to do it. And he looked at me and with a, with a serious look on his face, and he says, son, do you think you can handle this assignment? And I said, yes, sir, I certainly can. He says, well, we'll give you a try, and we'll, we'll see if you can do it. And uh, so I wound up uh, operating, uh, running phone patches from his house in the summers of 1968, 67, and 66. Uh, when school was out for the summer, I could not operate uh, during the school year because uh, schools, you know, the, the, the classes and, you know, all that kind of stuff just would, uh, would interfere. But uh, I had the 6 a.m. shift, the 6 a.m. to 10 a.m. shift. Is, that, and, is uh, that because you were the youngest and everybody else pulled rank on you? Yeah, absolutely. I was the, uh, you know, I was the. <laughs> so did, was, did you feel intimidated going there to do this big job of running phone patches? Uh, you know, I, I should have been, but I wasn't. I was so fascinated by the station. I was so fascinated by the mechanism that was in place to support those phone patches that, uh, I, you know, and I just stayed very focused on what it was that I had to do. So I didn't have really have a chance to get uh, uh, overtaken by it. Uh, they had, you know, this was back in the 60s. Uh, the phone company still, uh, this was Mountain Bell. Uh, they still had uh, human operators. Remember those? People, those young ladies that you could oh, talk yeah. to on yeah. the phone, you dial zero and you get an operator. They had three operators that would come online when we ran phone phone patches. One of them would do all the prep preparation work for the next call. The next operator would set up the call and get it ready, would brief the person on the other end. You know, there was a person sitting in a Mars station over there in Vietnam. Then there was the person, the, the, the family member back home. And so the second operator then would 
would give all the coaching to the person as to how to say over and all that kind of stuff because I was too busy or whoever was operating was too busy to do that. And then the third operator was the one that was actually monitoring the call and monitoring the phone patch, making sure that all the equipment and the connection was working, and then would break down the network, break down the connection as the next call was being set up. It was quite a machine, and it was very impressive the way it worked. And, uh, uh, and nobody ever got a chance to see it except for the operators, you know, who were sitting there in his station uh, running the phone patches. Well, you know, I saw that's interesting that the operators were actually working with you to help you set these calls up. Well, I think he had a little influence. Oh, okay. okay. All <laughs> right. So, now, do you think, uh, you know, and again, man, I tell you, uh, some of our, some of the, the new hams, the, the young ham, I mean, like, we're getting old. Let's just face it. And, uh, you know, I, I wonder sometimes if even some of the young hams even know what a phone patch is. But that's where we connected our radios to the phone circuits. And we made this link between the U.S. and Vietnam. And people there could talk to their family here. So do you think are, do you think there are any cases where phone patches are actually still being used very much today? I think in mission in, in the mission field, in Christian mission field, um, I remember there was a ministry very recently called Blessings for Obedience, BFO Ministries. And what they did was they, they started out just running phone patches to missionaries in Central and South America and in uh, Africa. And then they got involved later on in, in uh, getting receivers to, uh, uh, to people uh, in those countries so they could listen to shortwave broadcasting all over the world, listening to HCJB and other uh, other broadcasters. And uh, they also got involved with helping with communications with the Liberty Ships. I don't know if you guys remember the Liberty Ships. But, uh, but yeah, there, I believe that there still today, to this day, are phone patches being run to missionaries in uh, Central and South America who have no other way, no other means of uh, communicating uh, back home. Well, I, I haven't thought too much about it, but I can I can uh, truly understand that there are some very remote locations down there, so it would still come in very handy. Uh, here, let's here's a couple more pictures. Now there you are again. I think that this is one we had up a minute ago. Is that? Uh... That's in San Diego. Okay. I had my new call sign by then. I got N6NR back in uh, 1976, and uh -huh. I was working for General Dynamics at that time. Uh, on the F-16 modernization program, and that uh, station there, uh, you see me working meteor scatter on okay. uh, two meters. And wow. uh, the, the, wow. by the way, there was a guy that would get on uh, on single sideband two meters with with us, uh, and he his he he would identify himself as WB6 Noah, and I think we all know who that is, but. That, that was long before Gordon got involved with uh, with W5YI and with his wow. uh, his business with uh, uh, turning uh, hundreds and hundreds of people into radio amateurs. But uh, he was a very active uh, VHF uh, enthusiast uh, way back in the 70s. And uh, uh, we used to sit and talk and uh, uh, N6CA, W6XJ, uh, WB6NOA, Oh, goodness, and a bunch of others whose call signs I have since forgotten. But, uh, man, that goes back a ways. Well, about about what year was that? You were using, what, sideband on two meters, working meteor scatters. Is that, is that right? Yeah, it was about from about 1977 through to about, uh, let's see, I think I stopped doing it right around 81 or 82. But that was back when the meteor scatters, we didn't have, we didn't have all of these uh, fancy uh, programs, you know, like uh, – like uh, FSK 441 and, and others, uh, we just had high-speed CW. The faster well, you could send and copy, the better for, for working uh, working meteors. Well, I, I guess back then we didn't pro we probably didn't have computers. That's one reason we didn't have uh, <laughs> we didn't have all the uh, programs you're talking about. Yeah, here's another shot of you here. I think that's you. Oh, that's at uh, K6NCG. No. People don't know. People don't recognize that call sign. That's when I was in the Navy, going to uh, electronics technician, class A school, 
uh, Treasure Island uh, is an island in the middle of the San Francisco Bay, and that's uh, one of the one of the places where electronics technicians in the Navy went for their training. And uh, normally, when you're going through ETA school, um, uh, you had to stand duty. You know, you're on a on a duty watch schedule, and so you'd have to stand duty either you know at a gate or in a barracks and that kind of stuff. We were lucky if we had a ham license. Our duty station was running phone patches to Antarctica and handling message traffic on Navy Mars. And uh, so that's the brand new, uh, that was a picture of the brand new model uh, 28 ASR that we had just gotten uh, off of a uh, retired uh, destroyer escort that was uh, in Mare Island uh, up there. We, we were just thought we were in. Hog heaven when we had a Model 28 ASR. Hey, and about what year? Different. What year was that? That was 1969. 1969. Okay. I went in the Air Force in 1969, and guess what? They sent me. I became a teletype repairman, and I worked ah. on I worked on Model 28s and uh, in, in different uh, machines like that. Well, when I first got there, we were using a Model 19 ASR. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Let's see. So I, this is uh, this is you're getting into the Navy right there now. Man, who, uh, what is this? How did you find that picture? Man, my goodness they, gracious! And yes, those are my cigarettes. <laughs> oh, I, so you're smoking by this time? Yep. And that was back. It was, it was a short window of time when uh, uh, Admiral Elmo R. Zumwalt Jr. was the chief of naval operations. And he thought it would be good for morale if he were to allow the sailors to grow beards, and I had to be one of them. And so that's I was sporting a, a sporting a beard back then. That was just after ET school was over with, and I had just received my pro. And if you if you've been in the Navy, that means that you uh, went from from uh, from seaman to third class petty officer, and. Uh, so I was I was showing off my pro and I was showing off my beard. <laughs> uh, well, I I tell you, uh, it, it it seems like to me I I don't know how you found time in your life to do all these things. Uh, you were just mentioning, uh, uh, I guess the uh, a commander there, but you, you also have a story about wasn't it Curtis Lemay? Well, as it was relayed to me, I don't have this information firsthand. But I know it to be a true story that, uh, you see, people don't realize that Senator, Senator Goldwater Berry was also a major general in the United States Air Force. Mm -hmm. And he had a very close personal relationship with General Curtis LeMay. I don't remember uh, Curtis LeMay's call sign. It was W6 something or other. Anyway, but uh, General LeMay is, uh, is reported to have been the one that was responsible for getting Berry back on the air. Uh, Berry used to be a ham back when he was a young young man, teenager, and that kind of stuff, his old call sign, I think, if I remember correctly, was 6BPI. That was before the W was put in front of people's call signs. And then he had left amateur radio go by the wayside. Anyway, uh, it was during the 1964 presidential campaign when uh, Senator Barry Goldwater was running against Lyndon B. Johnson uh, for the presidency of the United States, that uh, uh, Curtis LeMay set up a, brought his Collins gear, set it up in a hotel room, stuck an antenna on the roof, and dragged Barry in, sat him down from the radio, and says, "Here, you play with this." And, and, and <laughs> make a long story short, uh, Jerry, uh, uh, Barry renewed his interest in amateur radio, got licensed, and that's the rest of the story. Well, General LeMay probably had more pull than me because if I took my rig to a hotel, I doubt they would let me put an antenna on the roof. Yeah. <laughs> so let's see. Okay, so uh, you were a ham, and you went in the military. You you continued. Uh, here's a shot. I think of uh, you're. A, are you a pilot? Uh, well, I lost my medical when I got diagnosed with type two diabetes. But yeah, flying has been one of my passions my whole life. That is my oldest granddaughter when she was about fourteen years old. Uh, that's Clarissa. She. Uh, uh, she's now 26. And by the way, as a chaplain, I get to marry her off this year. Is that right? She and, 
her boyfriend are getting married, and I, I don't know if I'm going to be able to get through that service without breaking down and crying, but oh. I'm sure looking forward to it. But uh, she loved to fly, and she was a natural, uh, and uh, she never got her pilot's license, but uh, that was her first flight. That well, I, I, I can tell flight. you, she looks like she's standing there trying to make a decision whether or not to get in with you. <laughs> Well, she did. All right. Very good. All right. Let's see. Oh, uh, uh, here's another shot. You look a little different here. Speaking of um, speaking of HCJB, there is Mr. DX Party Line himself in my ham shack. Uh, that's Alan Graham, uh -huh. who, was, who was the host of the DX Party Line, one of the most uh, beloved – English language service programs amongst the amateur radio and SWL communities that there was available. Uh, and uh, Alan had, uh, I think he, I don't remember if he took that program over or whether he created it himself, but he saw it to its end. Now, when, I'm not uh, familiar. I'm not familiar with that program. I, I guess I've never heard of it, but it was called DX Party Line. And what, DX what, Party what, what do you guys Line. talk about? We talked about everything. We talked about uh, transmitter schedules. We talked about people's equipment. We talked about radio personalities. And then uh, uh, Alan talked me into into uh, doing a segment on his program called Tech Talk with Dr. Rick. And what Alan would do is uh, he would field questions from the listeners, technical questions. And, uh, and then I would get a hold of those questions and I would put together a, a, a segment answering those questions. And I even did some interviews, uh, with technical ex experts and that kind of stuff. And, uh, and so I was on, uh, I think it was the last Saturday of every month, uh, on, uh, on the DX party line, really enjoyed that. And, uh, and Alan kept telling me, he says, uh, he says, boy, people keep writing in and telling me how much they love that segment. So, uh, so we kept doing it. Well, you know, maybe we need to do something like that on this show. I, I, I'm wanting to expand it to other things. So we'll, let's talk offline about that. Okay. Uh, let me see what else we got here now. This looks like, let me see if I can get them in order. We're going to go black and white first. Oh, boy. That was high school. Oh, uh, back in high school, huh? Which one of those, uh, I'll ask you the question, which one of those guys is me? Well, I'm guessing, uh, looking at it, maybe the, the second uh, from the right. No, that's what everybody thinks. Really? No, I'm, the guy, I'm the guy way over on the left. Oh, come on, man. Did, did you get, like, get run over and get disfigured or something? One of, one of my nicknames uh, was Stretch. And <laughs> I was six foot three. 141 pounds, skin and bones, and uh, I sang high tenor in a barbershop quartet. And it was at uh, the barbershop quartet for the showboat at Legend City. And anyone who's ever lived in Phoenix knows about Legend City. It was a theme park in Tempe, not far from there, Arizona State University campus. And, uh, and so uh, we were singing waiters. We would start out the show by... Uh, serving uh, soft drinks and popcorn and that kind of stuff, and we'd start our show right out in the middle of the uh, uh, of the uh, area where everybody was sitting, and then we'd make our way up to the stage and we'd sing a show and we'd do some variety work and all of that kind of stuff. And that was my first ever professional job as a vocalist. All right, and we've got another one here. Looks like a garage band. That is the Sweatwing Chicken Thieves, and uh, on my uh, on the left of the picture, playing bass, is Dave Soames, WB6TFC. Uh, that's me in the middle, still looking kind of skinny. And on the right is uh, one of the demonstration artists for the Gibson Banjo Company, Doug Moore, WB6YFG, and. Uh, Kenny, uh, I can't remember Kenny's last name anymore. I'm getting old. But that mandolin that he is playing is now owned by Ricky Skaggs. That was a 1927 Lloyd Lore wow. uh, Gibson mandolin. And we, uh, we played professionally. We were an opening act for many of the uh, 
a recording artist that would come to San Diego, and we truly enjoyed uh, that uh, that aspect of our life. And then uh, when I moved up to um, when I moved up to Fullerton, that was the end of our group. That was in 1989. Is when the group disbanded. But uh, uh, and that's probably going to lead up to your next question. Yeah, so but first, first let me say you don't look like a stretch. What do they call you, stretch? Yeah, they called me Stretch. Yeah, you don't look you don't look like Stretch there to me, and that also no, was, that looks a little like out. Elvis there with you. Yeah, <laughs> who Doug on the right? Yeah, yeah, on the right there. Yeah. All yeah, right. So look, my... look. This is this is the Swept Wing Chicken Thieves here, and what a name! But I, you knew you knew Wayne Green, seventy three magazine, Wayne Ooh, Wayne, yeah. and you guys got him to sing once in this group, didn't you? Well, he snuck up on us. We were this was we were playing a um, uh, a gig for the uh, AWRL Southwestern Division Convention in San Diego. I can't remember if it was 1986 or 1987, one of those two years. And uh, and we're we're playing, we're singing, all that kind of stuff. We're doing our doing our thing, and all of a sudden, from right but right behind me. I hear this absolutely beautiful, cultured, baritone voice singing absolutely impeccable uh, baritone harmonies right behind me. And we didn't have a baritone in the group, so he was filling in on the baritone part. And so when the, when the, when the tune ended, I turned around, and there he was. Uh, W2 Never Say Die himself. I had no idea that he was going to even be at the convention. I had no idea, none of us had any idea that the fact that he was a lover of bluegrass music. And uh, uh, so he sang with us for a while. He sang a few tunes with us, and then he went off and did whatever he was doing. But uh, I was really, we were all just absolutely shocked, amazed, and tickled to death that uh, Wayne Green came and uh, sat in with us on a few tunes that night. So was that the first time you met Wayne? Yes, that was how I met Wayne. And it was uh, several years later, he, you know, Wayne had an impeccable memory. Uh, and, and it just, he was a sharp, sharp, sharp uh, individual. And uh, uh, the DX, um, the DX editor had left 73 Magazine. He was looking for another one. And he just remembered me, remembered that I was a DX enthusiast and that kind of stuff. And he got in touch with me. And uh, and asked me if I would take over the uh, the DX column for 73 magazine. Make a long story short, I said yes, and I stayed as the uh, DX uh, columnist uh, for 73 magazine until the, the uh, magazine finally closed. And I also did a few uh, did a handful of uh, of technical uh, reviews of, of new equipment for 73 magazine as well. That was a lot of fun. So, you know, I, I don't remember much myself about Wayne Green. I took the magazine. I understand he was a little controversial in, in, in some aspects. What well, uh Ted, well what what do you remember about uh what do you remember about Wayne? Uh I think he was right on target. People say he was controversial. He was truthful. <laughs> yes, he was. That's that's what it was. He was truthful. He wasn't necessarily controversial. Now, for the people who were politically correct, who were not truthful, <laughs> he was controversial. Okay, that's, <laughs> that's that's how I would put it. But Ted, wouldn't you agree that he had a, just an overwhelming passion and love of amateur radio, and not too many people know because of the fact that that part of that persona that he created that helped him sell magazines was that. You know, that kind of edgy guy, but he really loved the league. He actually was very supportive of the ARRL and uh, at a very private level and uh, was so until the time that he passed away. Um, yeah. The thing that I think were that, uh, that caused Wayne to have, I guess I want to say, critics was the fact that he was so enthusiastic. He was so. Uh, determined i guess i want to say to promote the hobby make the hobby interesting he was always interested in doing something different you know not the same thing over and over and that's reflected in 73 if you look at the issues you can tell that 
you know, every issue was just about set up and, and directed toward being, a, you know, over the edge and a little different, out of the box, to make it more interesting. Um, and, and what's uh, kind of unfortunate about that is the fact that the, I guess I want to say the, the diehard curmudgeon is somewhat disturbed by people like that. <laughs> and, and I, I mean, that's just the way it is. I mean, that's been my observation not, not of, you're, uh, you're of Wayne. Using... You, you know, he, he didn't have to do anything controversial. He was just so full of energy and, and, uh, and so dedicated to the hobby with so much vision and enthusiasm um, that he, other people around him that didn't have that, he, he kind of dwarfed them. I guess that's the best way to put it. Well, you may recall, uh, Ted, that uh, back in the early days of Two Meter FM, he was one of the one of the guys who was uh, a cheerleader and a, a heavy promoter of of that aspect of amateur radio that we now take for granted. Oh yeah, a big big repeater. Promoter. I mean, I you know how how many repeaters do you think went on the air as a result of Wayne Green? Oh yeah, oh yeah. So uh, thanks for the opportunity to remember him. Uh, he was an interesting. Well, you know, so, something else that's really interesting about him is he he had um, he had all kinds of other ideas. Uh, like for example, I remember him, uh, I call it a medical device that he had come up with, where you put these um, electrodes around your ankles. And uh, there'd be some kind of battery voltage or something there, and he claimed that it it would uh, it would it'd clean up your blood. You know, <laughs> it would uh, it would eliminate bacteria and viruses and all that kind of stuff. And he was a big promoter. The reason why I know this is I've I've done several in-depth interviews with him. Matter of fact, I have a two-hour interview with Wayne Green in the can that's never been aired. And uh, oh, we're gonna we're gonna dig that up and and remember him with that. But he but he advocated eating raw foods and things like that. He he had some really different beliefs. Um, and, and, but yet you know what? He stayed in perfect health almost until the day he passed. So you know, we can't argue with him. You know. Yeah, and a brilliant mind too. Uh, uh, help me. Go- Make sure I get this correct, and correct me if I'm wrong, but wasn't he one of the early people that helped to establish a group called Mensa? You know, that I don't know. I know he was he was instrumental in computer magazines. He, he had oh, yeah. put out several different magazines, and some of those were the early, 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 you know, pre-IBM PC days. I mean, where, you know, computers were, that was, that was the whole thing. And before that... Uh, he had music magazines, did music reviews, mm-hmm. and and all that stuff. So he was just a very versatile guy. Really, really interesting. Well, let's uh, let's see. I got a couple more pictures here. Uh, we're going to talk about. Uh, hey, let's let's uh, talk about your station there, uh, uh, Doctor Rick. Here's a here's an aerial shot of uh, your uh, what's that? A step hour? Yep, that's four element stepper with a six meter kit uh, on it. And um, it's on a, uh, a HDX 589 MDPL uh, crank up, heavy duty uh, 89 foot crank up, and uh, it's uh, sitting at the 70 foot level there in that picture. And um, this is orchard country. This is uh, what we call the Natchez Heights up here in uh, uh, about 15 miles northwest of. Uh, uh, Yakima, Washington, in the central part, kind of nestled up against the foothills of the of the uh, uh, of the Cascade Mountains, the eastern slopes of the Cascade Mountains, and uh, uh, we, uh, Connie and I, my ex wild uh, Connie W seven CDO, the chief domestic officer, she uh, she and I have a Honeycrisp apple orchard, and uh, so that was the uh, there's the uh, our my uh, uh, oh, Gap Titan uh, DX uh, vertical, and that's sitting out in the uh, in the large block. That's in the nine-acre block of the orchard, and there are support wires for the trees. The trees are only about eight, nine feet tall, and they can't. You, we we don't grow them much taller than that because the apples are so big that they wouldn't be able to support the weight of the apples if they had too many of them on them. And there are support wires 
that run down those rows. There's one support wire right about the eight foot level, eight, nine foot level, and another one at about the three foot level, and they're all tied back to ground. So effectively, what you've got there is nine acres of elevated counterpoise sitting underneath that gap type DX vertical. And oh man, that works. It really works well. <laughs> yeah. I, I wish I had nine acres of trees so I could put me up something like that. Yeah, well, it's a, dream, it's, a, it's a dream come true. I think everybody, when they're young hams, they dream of having a nice station and that kind of stuff. My uh, original dream was to have uh, two 200-foot towers like my old friend uh, Glenn Ratman, K6NA. But uh, as I got older and finances, retirement finances started to come into focus, I was satisfied with uh, a single crank up with a stepper and uh, pretty darn happy with that, let me tell you. Well, and for those that can't put up a can't put up a, a beam or anything like that, uh, don't don't be discouraged. Put a piece of wire out there. Get your ham license. Put a piece of wire out there and talk to the world. So yeah, in the station here is uh, uh, I've got uh, um, an Elecraft. I don't know if you can see it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we see it. Uh, We'll Elecraft K3, and uh, and the I don't have the amplifier turned on, but that's an ex expert uh, one KFA uh, one kilowatt solid state amplifier. So that's what we've got here in the ham shack. Now you also don't you have a remote somewhere else in the house that remotes back into that? <laughs> yes, uh, I have the K3 twin, the K3 slash zero. That's in the library. And I have the ability to communicate there and uh, and actually run the whole station from from the library in the house. And I just I've been running remote stations since way back in uh, 2001 when I got my TS 2000. And uh, and I just love operating remote. We also have a club station about 25 miles north of us uh, in uh, near Ellensburg, Washington, that has, uh, you can look that station up for the call sign is whiskey seven, Charlie, November, Papa. There's a picture of the antenna, uh, on the, uh, on the web page there, or the uh, QRZ page. And that's a 160 foot tall, uh, rotating monopole, a super Bertha. And mounted on that is a pair of, uh, stepper DB 42s. Uh, uh, Monster IR uh, antennas, and then we've got some VHF antennas. But we've also got uh, uh, K3 uh, in that station in a uh, expert 2 KFA amplifier, and that all operates by remote control. And I can sit in my library and just change the profile on my K3 twin, and now I'm talking through the club station up there in uh, up there in Ellensburg. Uh, the technology is just remarkable that we have hams have to play with who knew 50 years ago that we would be able to do these things yeah it's uh it's really changed i know back uh i mean w w when you were 16 running phone patches to vietnam I, I guess barry had a really nice station set up there um I, I obviously didn't have a station that that nice set up when i was 16 because i I think I probably didn't work, but three or four DX stations uh, my whole time as a novice. Uh, but nowadays, with the way this technology has changed, man, you know, hey, a simple uh, a, a transceiver and a wire antenna or a beam, and, you know, you talk to the world. It's so easy now. Don't you think it was harder back then? Yes, it was. It, and the entry uh, into amateur radio was much more difficult back then. It was much more demanding. Um I remember when I took my amateur extra class license exam, I think it was in 1969, it was a 100 question test. You had to draw schematics and uh, block diagrams, uh, and you had to be able to articulate to the FCC examiner that was standing there in front of you what was going on in those diagrams, and then you had to endure a 20 word per minute code proficiency exam where you had to both receive and transmit uh, at 20 words per minute uh, to their satisfaction. And, uh, uh, and I think it made us better hams. It gave us that grounding in, in the radio form, in the radio art, that allowed us to handle the limitations of the technology. 
And uh, I'm really grateful for the fact that it was that tough to get a ham license back then. Yeah, yeah. Things have really changed a lot. Now, you were, let's talk about your singing, man. I, I, what is this I'm looking at right here? I mean, I'm, I, I was a little worried <laughs> about putting this on here. <laughs> the title of that picture is The Devil in Me. Um, yeah, theater arts, it, what goes back to high school, uh, I had two, two passions in high school. One was amateur radio and the other was theater arts. And both stayed with me to this very day. And uh, that is me playing the part of the devil. And uh, uh, you, by the way, you yeah. see that little, uh, you see that red pin? I see with it, yeah. With a picture of Lennon uh, uh, on it? No, I, I can't tell what's on it. Okay, well, that is what is known as the Young Pioneers pin, kind of the, 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 the Russian communist version of the Boy Scouts of America. <laughs> oh, man. But that was given to me by uh, Gene Kostroman, UA4RZ. And that's an interesting story because Gene and I used to talk to each other on 20 meters long before the fall of the Iron Curtain, uh, back when he was uh, – I can't tell you uh, – what he used to do for a living, but he used to work for uh, he used to work for the Russian government. And uh, uh -huh. when the Iron Curtain fell, the Western Washington DX Club uh, sponsored him to come over for a visit, and he stayed at our house. He stayed at stayed in the houses of a few other people uh, in uh, uh, in the Seattle area when he came when he came to the United States, and uh, he gave me that pin. That was his. Young Pioneers pin, and so I used it as part of my costume. It was supposed to look like the devil, huh. and uh, <laughs> and it served that purpose at least on stage. All right. Well, you look like a warrior here. I am. I am. I'm singing the role of the first armored man in uh, Mozart's uh, Magic Flute, and that is Pamina. That's the uh, the little princess that uh, Pomino wants to get married to. And uh, it was my job to keep the two of them apart so that they couldn't get together. And uh, in this absolutely wonderful, beautiful coloratura soprano singing in my right ear, that was a wonderful moment. And uh, one of the uh, – uh, one of the uh, – uh, uh, photographers from the, from the opera company caught that – photograph and gave it to me and I just uh, so I, I treasure that uh, that moment being on stage well you you worked a uh, number of uh, jobs uh, over the years and uh, a lot of high-tech jobs and uh, you keep retiring but you keep going back I think here's a recent picture of you yeah that's been I was at Eastside Fire and Rescue uh, back when we lived on the west side uh, in the Issaquah area I spent 14 years with uh, Eastside Fire and Rescue, and that was my that was my uh, first real role as a police and fire chaplain. Uh -huh. And uh, I have considerably less hair now than I, than I did in that photograph. Is that why you have the hat on tonight? Yeah, as a matter of fact, yeah, I don't want too much glare. Oh, you, know, to <laughs> uh, you know, I'm starting to get the same way, and uh, you know, I you know, it's starting to bother me a little bit here. I guess I'll have but to I love singing. I, I truly love singing, and it was an honor to sing in the San Diego Opera and in the Seattle Opera Company. Uh, but now I'm 66 years old, and tenors at age 50 begin to lose their voice. And I doubt very seriously if today I could pass the audition for the Seattle Opera. But uh, it's in the record books. It's in my memories, and I, I was honored. And, and what a privilege it was to be on the stage with the very best of the best. I can remember sing, singing shoulder to shoulder uh, with uh, Dame Joan Sutherland when she sang the title role in Lucia de la Marmore. And, oh, did she have a voice. And out in the audience, it sound like, sounded like she was singing really softly uh, when she was doing the mad scene in Luc Lucia de la Marmore. My left ear was ringing because she was focusing that voice straight up into the overhead, and that's how she would handle her, manage her dynamics from the way that she could, where she could focus her voice. What an incredible talent uh, she was, and uh, it's it's sad that she has since left us.
Well, I tell you, I need to get you and, and Ted together to talk about music. And uh, Ted, Ted knows all these these things about music. Ted, what, what was that? What's that song? Ma, Mama sang. No, Ma, Daddy sang bass. Mama sang tenor. <laughs> you know, that's, that's that's a country tune. Yeah, you know. I did. And now, now. Uh, that's Dr. a no, that's Rick. a long way, a long way from opera, but not too far away from Opry. <laughs> from <laughs> Opry, yeah. Now, now Doctor Rick, you did you did some bluegrass. I mean, you're right. that, that band was bluegrass gospel, so yeah. Uh, you yeah, were, and, and I got it. It was fun getting to know some of the uh, some of the the uh, recording artists, uh, Ralph Stanley. Uh, Ralph Stanley asked us, uh, we were playing the, uh, the Norco Bluegrass Festival. It was in 1987 or 1988. And we opened for Ralph Stanley. And, uh, we came off the stage and he come up to us and, and got us in a semicircle and he said, you know, you boys ought to consider going on the road. Maybe you could go on the road with us. And we looked at him and we thought of our kids. We thought of our wives, we thought of our day jobs, we thought of our mortgages, and we knew, we knew the, what the nomadic lifestyle of a bluegrass artist was. And we said, we said, you honor us, sir, but we have to respectfully decline. And, uh, but uh, to have the opportunity to know these, these wonderful recording artists uh, personally, John Duffy from Seldom Seen. Uh, Ted, I don't know if you're a bluegrass aficionado, and if, if you remember John Duffy uh, from Sel Seldom Seen. I can remember being back in uh, Arlington, Virginia. We were going to go to the Birchmere and, and hear him play that night, and we turned on the radio in the morning, and they were playing all this nostalgia music. It was the day that John Duffy passed away. We got it. We got to go to his wake. And there he was laid out in the coffin in his bowling shirt, of all things. And it's just, just the way bluegrass artists are. Well, I remember the group Seldom Seen. I don't necessarily recall him, but uh, we were living in uh, Hendersonville uh, off of uh, Hogan's Branch Road. And I remember Bill Monroe just lived maybe two miles from us. And uh, I remember going by his place and the uh, They'd be outside in the in the you know out, out in the the yard picking and playing playing uh, music. Um, uh, Gene, I mean, it seems like Gene Wooten, who was originally with I think he was with Wilma Lee Cooper for a while, and there was Stan Brown was with Wilma Lee. They both wound up with uh, uh, playing for Bill Monroe, and uh, but it was it's kind of cool to go like backstage at the Opry and hear these people practice in. The uh, dressing rooms. Uh, mm. My goodness! I mean, you can't you can't even imagine how proficient they are and how good it sounds um, until you're standing in one of those dressing rooms up close to those instruments, hearing them played. It would absolutely blow your mind. And then, then after their performance, they'd all gather and go over to the Ernest Tubb record the record shop and do an impromptu concert back in the back, way back in the back of the, the uh, Ernest Tubbs uh, record shop there. And those were, yeah. And you know, of course, a lot of those artists would leave out and go over there because they ran the midnight jamboree mm -hmm. on, uh, on WSM. And that disappeared for a while. I don't know if it's back or not, but uh, that midnight jamboree has been something that's been going on for a long time and all sorts of, uh, you know, major artists have been there. Um, and, a, you know, I've been on the air after, you know, after WSM, which was kind of interesting because <laughs> Marty Robbins used to make the Opry just go on and on and hold it over so long. And the folks at the Midnight Jamboree just had to wait. <laughs> <You know? laughs> they were going to start at midnight. They, they'd start whenever Marty was done singing. And after Marty passed, then Johnny Russell continued that. He would always close out the opera, and then he would just stretch it out as far as he could. But the people loved it because I think they all caught on to what was going on. It was like, how far can we go and uh, make, the, make those folks from the Artist Type Record Shop wait, <laughs> you know, to get on the air with their midnight jamboree? Well, people don't realize just how diverse those uh, artists are. Uh, going back to John Duffy, uh, you'd re you'd remember him if you saw him. He was the mandolin player, the really eclectic uh, mandolin player, and uh, he had a real high tenor voice. 
Well, his father was a an opera tenor, and John Duffy himself had been classified as a Heldon tenor. He could have gone into the opera himself, but he had such a passion for bluegrass and country music and that kind of stuff, and that was the road that he chose. But those skills that he had developed as a young man were the skills that he used to have that absolutely pure, cultured, tenor, high, high, lonesome tenor voice uh, that he sang with, uh, with the seldom scene and with the country gentleman before. Oh, then that was the <laughs> that was the the trademark of Bill Monroe was that really high tenor voice. Mm -hmm. And uh, you'd see the man, and you just couldn't believe that <laughs> that that's what he he sounded like. But when, when he talked in person, it was the same way. His his voice was just pitched high. You know, he'd say, "How you how you doing?" Yeah, I'm doing pretty good. You know, that <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, he was uh, he was special. But seldom seen, though. Um, you know, they were. Uh, if the best of my I can recollect, they were really big. I mean, they that group uh, just kind of um, took over bluegrass for a while. Am I am I right in that? I mean, it seems like I remember that. Oh yes, yes, and uh, and they were also known for how approachable and how friendly they were to their fans, and they would uh, have weekly concerts at the Birchmere. Uh, I think it was either a restaurant or just a pub or something like that there in uh, Northern Virginia. And, uh, and you know, and, and people would get to sit, you know, six feet away from them, you know, and listen to them play. And, and uh, they'd engage uh, personally with the crowd and that kind of stuff. And, and uh, they were just wonderful, wonderful musicians. Well, uh, some of them are seldom seen is actually still together from what I understand, but uh, Missing, uh, missing the personality and voice of John Duffy, of course. Well, guys, I think it's been an interesting night for us. Uh, we could probably talk for hours. I mean, I'd, I'd love to talk for an hour on many of the different subjects we hit on tonight. So, we'll. Uh, well, can I, we'll can I say something, Tom? Yeah, go ahead. I think we should. You and I should both acknowledge uh, the individual who has put on Facebook the 50 years and beyond uh, little uh, whatever you want to call it uh, on Facebook, Facebook page, because I think it's important for the new hams today to learn about the craft of amateur radio, not just the experience and the operating pleasure and that kind of stuff, but basically the craft of amateur radio and how it's evolved, the stuff that's, that stood the test of time, the traditions that we now still still observe, the young guys today, it, it would be useful for them to understand where all that comes from, and maybe they'll treasure that for us in the future when we're all long gone. Well, I, I agree with you, and that's where I met you on that uh, Facebook group, uh, Ham Radio, what it's called, Ham Radio 50 Years or More, or something like that. If just put in yep. Ham Radio 50 Years, and you'll come up with that uh, that website. And uh, uh, actually, if you go to the very beginning when that website was first created, you'll see my QSL card on there. And uh, I, I worked several of the guys uh, that started that uh, site up. And uh, uh, we both found the QSL cards that we sent each other 50, 51 years ago. And we posted those uh, on, on that site. So it's Ham Radio 50 Years. Well, Tom and Ted, thank you very, very much for allowing me a nobody, basically, to to come on and, and be a part of this program. I am a devotee, as I said before, of the work that uh, that both of you are doing, and uh, and I really, really enjoy uh, what you present and, and put forth on the radio and on the internet. And uh, to be part of this thing is really a really an honor and a pleasure. Thank you very, very much. We're glad to have you and uh, somebody that's that versatile. You know, I, let me just say this. I don't think a lot of folks, I don't think, uh, can, can put amateur radio and opera together. That's, that's <laughs> right. That's I, right. I, I think that's, you know, but, you know, I'll tell you something. Uh, I, in Detroit years ago, I worked at WQRS, a classical music station, and um, that was my first exposure to to opera and um 
I remember on July the 4th, and I don't know what year it was. It was a long time ago. Uh, we were in the Detroit Trade Center building. That's where WQRS was. And uh, they were going to play Faust that night. So I had a stack of LPs, 33 RPM records, which the standard thing was is you played, once you started it, you never stopped it. In other words, you played side one, flipped it side two, put the next, next 33 RPM on side one, flip it to side two. And it was July the 4th, and there was fireworks. And uh, so I put the first the first album on, flipped it, and went to the second album. By then, they were shooting the fireworks off the barges on the Detroit River. So I snuck upstairs in the elevator and went up to the roof of the Detroit Trade Center building so I could see the fireworks. And um, basically, I forgot what time it was. <laughs> and so I headed back down. And that album was tracking the end, going flip, 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 flip you know. Uh, and I, and all the lines of the station were lit up, every one of them. And uh, so I had flipped the record over, restarted it. Everybody at that point was happy, but I started answering the phone. And I'm going to tell you something. You have not experienced life in total until you've heard an angry opera fan on the phone. <laughs> Just absolutely giving you the devil because you let the record run out. Oh, my goodness. These people were so dedicated, and they were so offended by it, you know. Of course, I was just a kid, you know, so, I, you know, to me it was like, ah, it ended, you know. <laughs> so, anyways, but then after that, I, I began to realize, <clears throat> excuse me, began to realize these people were, um, they, they weren't just, um, uh, how, how do I want to say it? They weren't just fans. There was a certain dedication that they had to the music. There was something uh, in the way of commitment that they had to opera. And uh, I, I haven't seen that, I don't guess, in any other form of music. I mean, you could play, you know, chamber music. You could play anything classical. And people were, they, the people were fans. But the opera, well, folks, when you start messing around with opera, you better do it right because they will not accept. Um, you know, somebody, I guess I want to say they, they don't, they would not accept a teenage kid sloughing off on the job. Let's put it that way. No, no, no. And I, I remember watching a, um, an artistic director once get booed off the stage at the end of Aida because he did not have a procession of camels and horses and all sorts of during the grand scene, uh, you know, the, uh, the grand procession scene. Uh, he had instead brought in little dolls and things to, to, to uh, uh, because it was a, a lower budget uh, uh, production of Aida. But because of the fact that he did not do what is done in Aida and have a procession of live animals across the stage, he got booed off the stage when he came out for his curtain call. I'll never forget I, that. I, 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 can, I can believe that totally. But I, I, I applaud you because I think, uh, you, know, I, you know, I think sometimes that, that uh, groups of people, and amateur radio is a good group of people, I think sometimes we need to pause and... Uh, and allow ourselves, I guess, the time to to be exposed to things like opera and understand it, uh, because um, it's you know it's a it's a completely different, refined form of music that I think has the ability to capture the soul of a human being, uh, if if given the chance. And uh, anyways, that's that's all that's all I want to say about that. Let me. I, I see a comment in the chat room. I think it's. Uh a very nice comment. James said, I nominate Rich Olson as one of the most interesting men in the world. What do you think about that? <laughs> oh, goodness. That's... My my wife would disagree. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, all right. Well, look, hey, I tell you what, Dr. Rick, <laughs> man, it's, it's, it's been enjoyable tonight to uh, to talk with you. And uh, we're going to probably move on to a couple of things right here. And Hey, Ted, uh, is your camera person, is Holly there? I mean, would you like to give people a tour Actually, of your to tell you the truth, I want them to talk about field day. So what I'm going to okay, do okay. is I'm going to move off of this camera, which I've got to move a long ways to get this out of the way. But I'm going to move off camera and let, um, and let them, uh, David and Holly both, and she's got a friend with her, 
talk to you about the, the date and time and the phone number for field day. Okay. That, that, that'd be great. And that was also a subject I wanted to talk about tonight. 73, uh, Dr. Rick, we'll, uh, we'll talk to you later. Once again, thanks. And, and, and hey, uh, Dr. Rick, uh, feel free to stay on Skype if you want to for the rest of the show. And, and, uh, yeah, I'll just, I'll yeah. just hit the mute. I'll hit the mute button here. All right. Very good. Very good. Thank you. And look at there. I've, I see, uh, I see Holly there. Look at there. Holly. And I don't know who that's with Holly. Let's see. This is Zoe. Zoe? Uh, okay. So, uh, Holly, what are we going to do field day? Talk to us. Well, the, I guess, amateurs at their field day locations are going to call in to the number on the screen, 615-813-0173, and then Ted will give them a call back, um, and we'll go live on the air and talk about it. Okay, and, and um, that's uh, David with you. I see David there. David, what have you been doing ooh, in the background? There, sir. What have you been doing yes, in the background? Yes, I am. You've been keeping a level me, good and everything? Or? Yes, sir, taking, taking care of everything. Listen, I am really excited to hear about all of the field day food that's going to be out there. I, I love hearing about uh, all of the... Um, all the barbecue and all of the different fixings and everything that everybody's eating out at their uh, out in their tent outside. Yeah, yeah, I am too. You know, how come a hot dog or something cooked at field day tastes better than one cooked at home? What what's the difference? Are they are they just cheap hot dogs? Is that what the difference is? I don't know. Someone else cook them. They're like uh, hemp fest hot dogs. Yeah. It's all the RF exposure. <laughs> The RF exposure. Um, All right. Also, so, I want to mention that um, people can text that number as well. Okay, um, so if they just text, text it, you'll call them back as as you can uh, yep. uh, get to them, right? And what yeah. do you uh, what do you want these guys to tell you when they call in? What are you looking for? Uh, just anything about their ham radio field day setup, their food, like David mentioned. Um, you know how many people, kids, uh, pass the cell phone around. If there's any officials, city officials there, you know whatever. Um, what kind of power they're running? If they run solar, you know generator, what have you. Yeah. Uh, we'll just put them on the radio and talk about it. Ted will give them a. Well, yeah, well, cool. I might even try to call in if I can if I can get through. I know your numbers are going to be very very busy there. And did something happen? Up, oh, we just lost. Uh, we just lost Holly. Okay, let's see if we can get let's see if we can get them back. Oh, let's see. We're, we're trying to get them. Okay, we got you back here. We lost you. So Holly, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, you need to get a little closer to the microphone. I was gonna let David jump in here. Okay, come on up here, David. Yes, sir. So uh, you guys are gonna be uh, what? You're not gonna be out anywhere field day, but is that where you're gonna be right there in your studio? We will be. We'll be right here, manning the telephones and uh, taking all your calls live. Live on the radio. And what what are the hours going to be? You guys going to be on all day, every day, uh, uh, throughout the weekend? All right. Uh, all right. So you said two o'clock. Two two o'clock central. Two o'clock central daylight time is when we're going to go live. Okay. At least that's that's the plan. Two o'clock. And then Miss Holly remembered the UTC, but I don't remember what it was now. Well, we got to add uh, five hours to fourteen hundred, so that would be. Uh, I, I, 19, I have to take 1900, the shoot off. 1900 Zulu. UTC 1900. I think. Yeah. Take your shoot. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, I, like I said, I'm. I'll try to call in. Maybe I can get through to you guys. Uh, I'll text you or something. And I'm gonna. I'm gonna uh, hit a couple of field day locations. We're not gonna be streaming anything live this year, but uh, I'm gonna record a little bit. Uh, maybe that we can edit and put on one of the other shows there. Uh, you guys get a lot of calls. You've been doing this now a, a number of years. You, you get a lot of people calling in, don't you? Yeah, we've had uh, plenty of people from uh, overseas. Um, we've had, uh, if I'm not mistaken, we've had uh, all 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 states call in. 
uh, including uh, we've had uh, two two clubs call from Hawaii. Uh, we've had Puerto Rico call in, um, Afghanistan. Afghanistan. Uh, wow. We've had uh, uh, Europe call in as well. Um, Germany, France. Uh, we need to get a map and start London. London. You know, all over the place. So very, very, very happy to have anyone give a call in. And uh, and again, like Holly was saying, just talk about anything you got going on there at the uh, at your tent. Well, uh, uh, you know, one and, place you didn't mention was Olive Branch, Mississippi. I, I'll try to call in from there, so you you guys can put a pin well, in your map. Well, we'll try and get a QSO from there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. Yeah, anything else you want to talk about on, about field day? I'm, I'm, I'm sorry? Anything else uh, you guys want to talk about? Anything uh, Anything interesting? Are you gonna, uh, uh, is this going to be played back at a, at a different time? It's going to be live, but is it also going to be played back? No, no, later? yeah, yeah this, this will be live. Uh, we'll be live, live on the air, and we'll be taking, uh, taking calls, taking calls live. And again, you, know, you don't even have to, it doesn't have to be a club. You can be, uh, and you can just be a, a gentleman there in your, in your ham shack. You know, you know, yeah, single people there having fun, uh, hanging out, doing field day. Yeah, and I may have you missed. Know, we're it. just out here promoting the hobby. I may have missed it if Holly mentioned it because I'm I'm working a lot of knobs and stuff here. But is the frequency going to be the same uh, fifty eighty five? No, no, it'll be ninety nine thirty. Ninety nine thirty. Ninety nine thirty. Until if we stay on much later. Yeah. Then we. Yeah. If if it goes. It, yeah. If we go past seven o'clock, then we'll then we'll change the frequencies. All right. But you'll be on ninety nine thirty kilohertz until about seven p.m. Yes, sir. Okay. That's that's cool. That's cool. Uh. Hey. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh. See if Ted wants to show any of his radios off here. We while we got you guys. You guys. You, you're camera operators. Does Ted? You want to show your station? Well. Somebody behind the camera. Cause well, you've got a you've got a couple of excellent camera people there. Yeah. So what I'll do is let me uh, let me drag the microphone over here, and uh, that way we won't uh, we won't be uh, okay in the okay. way. You're sounding good. Well, you can see the the mic boom. Yeah, I, I don't know. I guess you could start over here uh, on the left hand side on the top. I guess if you wanted to if you want to do a radio scan. I see. Now, now, Ted, That's, uh, did, uh, you've been collecting these things for a long time. You got quite a collection there. I can't fit them all in here. I mean, I've got, I've got a lot more radios that that I, I wish I could. I wish my operating point was was where I could just put everything in here, but I can't. So this is a two piece Halicrafter station. This is these are kind of rare. They're hard to find. Uh, and on top of the, uh, on top of the receiver, I believe it's the receiver on the left. Um, there's a, a Yesu. <laughs> this is funny. Uh, 757, and on top it is uh is an is an Alinko, um DX70. Then to the right of the Yesu is an Icom 751, and um, uh, that oh I'm just gonna say that particular 751 uh, came to us via Ronnie Millsap. Ronnie uh, gave us a bunch of Ham gear, and this was the um, <laughs> this was the controversial thing, where we had one of them, and that's the particular radio that just it's just dead as a doornail, and, <laughs> and we I, said, I don't know, I mean it looks like it was, it looks like it just came out of the factory, but uh, the, the DC power supply doesn't work. Uh, the uh, if you put DC to it, well, anyways, the long story short is is uh, we were working out a deal with the Country Music Hall of Fame to get a. Uh, uh, a radio station or a ham station set up over there that hams could come in and operate. And we were trying to do that utilizing all of uh, vintage equipment uh, and, and Millsaps equipment being a real miles, milestone in that. So that was, that was the attempt uh, to do that. And we've got a, that's where we got into the controversial thing with Kenwood. We have a TS 930 that's uh, uh puts out five Watts. Oh, <laughs> I don't really? think there's a whole lot wrong with it. I, I, I'm guessing. I'm guessing that most people in here know who Ronnie Millsap is. Again, you know, we've got a lot of young people on here, maybe some Troy listeners, but yeah, Ron, Ronnie, Ronnie's a, Ronnie's a recording call sign is artist, w, right? Uh, w, his call sign is WB4KCG, 
but um, he's a country music performer. He was blind from birth, and he um, he's probably had what forty something number one songs, and I don't know how many Grammys. The guy I, I love his music. Oh. I really like his music, man. Um, so if you want to, yeah, let's keep going. The, the camera. We got we got Drake coming up here. Uh, there's MS4 power supply. There's a TR4C, and they're a pair of Drake twins. And uh, then a spare MS4 power supply, because uh, usually I don't run anymore. I, I run the TR4C or, or the Twins by themselves, and I don't know if you can get all of those in there. You got man. Okay. Now <laughs> those are Ronnie Millsap go. origination, also, aren't they? Um, the the Twins are. Okay. The, the 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 two Twins. That's an interesting story. We got a call about I don't know what time it was. About one in the morning. And um, he kind of doesn't really keep up with time. And uh, he calls about one in the morning and he says, I'm trying to burn some CDs. Do you all think you could uh, find me a copy of Roxio? Something's happened to my Roxio CD-ROM, uh, the burner software. And uh, so he said, do you think Holly can find the version? Now, he has to have the exact version for his software because it's it's JAWS and JAWS is, is for uh, for the blind to use, and of course that has to interface exactly uh, to the to the software. So, anyways, mm -hmm. um, Holly got to looking for it, and she found the version. So we called him and said, "Hey, we found the exact version." So we went over there, and she put it on the computer. And then when he was he was working, and he was really tickled, but he kind of had this planned out, I think, as he said, "Come on over here to the doghouse." Now the doghouse is where he has his home studio, where he used to have his ham station, and um, Anyways, we went over there, and he asked if – he said, do you see these boxes? you think they'd fit in your vehicle? And David said, yeah. So he said, well, David, take them out to your car. So he took them out to the car, and I said, Ronnie, what is this? And uh, he said, well, you've always wanted a pair of Drake twins. He said, now you have a pair. And, uh, I mean, they look like they came right out of the factory. They were in the original Drake boxes. Uh, just really, really incredible. Um, and that was quite humbling to have a – a station that belonged to such a tremendous uh, uh, country music performer who also was a ham. And um, it was, yeah, like I said, it was just a very humbling thing. Yeah. Uh, and, and I guess that also inspired us to try to uh, to get some of the other pieces like the Kenwood TS-930 and uh, some of the icon pieces and whatnot into the Country Music Hall of Fame so that um, – uh, hams could come into nashville and operate a station that you know that it was at the country music hall of fame and do special event stations or or anything else and uh let's see here below that are two vhf uh icoms one on the right so 440 all mode and the one on the left is a two meter all mode and the one be hiding behind the d104 is a 220 which uh, <laughs> I never use. Oh, 220 <laughs> so, is very popular here in Memphis. We've got a big group on there. Well, we've had, we've had a we, we've got a pretty active group here, but uh, there, I, let's put it this way. There's a lot of misbehaving on, on 220 oh, here really? in Nashville. So. Uh, to the left of that, there is another 757GX, Yesu, and an ICOM 746, not the Pro. This is the original old one. And then below that, with the dial lit up, is uh, ICOM 718, another 751 to the right. And then as you go to the right of that, there are three Drake TR4Cs. Wow. And um, I don't know, once you start collecting things, you, you people say, well, why do you need all of those? Well, you, obviously, you don't even, all you need is one radio. The little ICOM 718 would <laughs> keep me on the air. You know? <laughs> but it's like, you know, you become obsessed with it. Let's see. Um, on the very bottom, on the very bottom roll is an R RME. I don't know if you can. Yeah. You, yeah, you're down there. Okay, there's the RME receiver. Uh, that's beautiful. The audio on that thing is absolutely incredible. There's an old analog meter on the right that's up in the corner there, uh, which is when I it, it, this mm -hmm. just it's a good vintage piece. It's a great AM receiver. Oh my goodness, the audio is incredible. And then to the left of that is a Central Electronics 100, and uh, that thing is a sideband, um, I guess a sideband exciter, but it also does CW and AM, and it's a great AM rig. 
Mm-hmm. So pairing that up, those two make a great AM station. And then to the left is uh, an older Ni- Ni Viking tuner, uh, which I could use with those two pieces without, uh, you know, uh, without having to disturb the, um, the Johnson matchbox. And I skipped over that. Mm-hmm. There's a Johnson matchbox up there, a KW version. Um, there it is. Yeah. I love those things. I don't know what it is about them. But I just love the KW matchboxes next to it. It's an Ameritron AL1200. And uh, that runs the 3CX. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, is it 3CX? 1200. Uh, I'm trying to think. What's the designation after that tube? I don't know. It's pretty rugged. The, 12, uh, the 3CX1200 or 1200 is a, is a fairly rugged tube. Supposedly, it can take a lot of abuse. So I guess that's the perfect amplifier for me. Because Oh, yeah. I'm probably going to be slouchy on the tune-up, you know, working in broadcast radio. You tune these broadcast transmitters all day long, so you, you get into the ham shack and you don't even bother tuning things up. So I, that's kind of a rundown. Now, the other part over here I guess you might want to see is the studio equipment for the broadcast part of it. Yeah. Uh, and that's an autogram console, an older autogram analog console. I just love large consoles. Um, actually David procured that for me at Christmas time. And, uh, that was quite a thing to open up under the Christmas tree. Um, and to the right up above that is this thing called a soft surface. Um, and, and there's a story behind that, this thing here. And as you, as I'm talking, you can see my voice. That's actually what's feeding the, uh, the audio to the WTWW transmitter. It's a it's a it's a soft surface, I guess the best way I can describe it, but it goes with a computer uh, down below, and Matt had built a what, the, what is known as an Axia mix engine on this computer below, um, and it's the one to the um, to the left down here with the door open on it, and so that operates the soft surface. The soft surface is an actual virtual board that you can operate off a computer screen. And um, the audio travels over IP. There's no analog connections. Matter of fact, I've got all these computers underneath. Can you zoom in on them? We've got well, we've got a stream that goes out that plays nothing but oldies, um, 24 hours, seven days a week. It's called Upstream. And you can get to it on QSO, uh, QSORadioShow.com. You go to that front page and just scroll down, and uh, you'll see upstream well it runs on here 24 7 and then we have the qso um stream the actual qso stream or broadcast station if you want to call it that it plays all of the old qso shows we were playing amateur radio newsline and uh, we will be putting some episodes of that up on uh of uh, of the amateur radio roundtable so you'll be able to tune in any time of the day or night this qso stream runs um 24 hours a day, seven days a week. But what I wanted to say about all the computers underneath there in that is none of them have sound cards. (laughs) Mm -hmm. I know that sounds crazy. There's not one sound card in any of these. Um, They all run uh, the Axia driver, which means that all the audio uh, travels in and out of those machines over IP. And uh, it's, it's a tremendous system it's amazing because i can go in on a on a on a little menu and click and move any source to any destination any destination to any source so it's um it's it's really it's really cool and then of course there's a rack to the right here the 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 rack is uh it's just got all the necessary evil in it at the very top you'll see two axia nodes and those uh have have inputs and outputs and are addressable to any of the computers. Anything you've got plugged into a node, you can see on any computer by selecting it on the menu. I know I'm, I'm probably talking Greek to some folks, but this is, I mean, this system is incredible. Um, I fought it at first. <laughs> Matt and David said, you got to go this way. Oh, I don't want that. I want an old analog console. I want hard wiring between everything. I don't want any of this over IP baloney. But actually, once I got into it, now I'm totally dependent on it. I'm like a heroin addict. Uh, without this system, I probably would just give up and quit. <laughs> but anyways, below that, you'll see the um, um, 
the uh, the switches that are used, and uh, below that there's a there's a small Telos hybrid in the rack, um, and that thing is um, it, it'll handle one phone line. Normally we have a multiple line Telos, but it blew up last night. I'm just kind of wondering if it might have been from that the solar storm that we're supposed to have had. I don't know if you heard anything about that. Yeah, I was trying to been. read up on it. Um, the graphic equalizer and the process below that are used for uh, EQing the telephone circuits and making the, the telephone circuit sound better. There's a reverb, so when we're doing oldies on Saturday or Sunday nights, we can make it sound like uh, Top 40 radio in the 60s. Uh, and then there's a mic processor. There's an M1 there, which I absolutely love, made by Wheatstone. And uh, it's, um, it, it's quite the thing. Below that is um, a stereo expander, and that is to expand the stereo for the streams that we're running, like on Upstream. Uh, and if you're an oldies fan, you got to check out Upstream. You just got to you got to go up there and listen to it. Below that is a, another audio processor called a Vorsis, and um, we kind of use that to mimic what the sound is uh, coming out of the shortwave transmitter because we have uh, Omnia One processors there, and uh, those things are um, they treat the audio a certain way, and so we kind of want to listen to something close to that here in the studio, so we mix the voice right. Below that's a dual cassette deck, and then I, and then you, you probably, uh, I don't know if you can see the two turntables. Um, there's I have to, still two turntables in here, so I can actually go on live and play vinyl just like in the good old days, as they say. And then there, of all things, there is a Wallensack. Uh, 1580 reel-to-reel -reel machine I can mm -hmm. use to transfer audio off of old reel-to-reels, and I—that's about that. Just about does it, other than the uh, yeah, well, minus a couple of computers that you can't see. Well, Ted, I, I, I was guess gonna, before I, we did this, I should have cleaned the place up a little bit. I was going to say, uh, Ted, you, you're you're having too much equipment, but there's a song out there about. There's no such thing as too much equipment. What's that song? You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, no such thing as too much fun. No such yeah, thing Holly as too said much I fun. forgot to mention the, the mechanical keyboards yeah. um, that uh, are, um, are the, the glow green, um, uh -huh. and they're and they're mechanical. I mean, when you punch it, when you push the push the buttons down, they go click. <laughs> oh, okay. And uh, yeah, you need a couple of those. Yeah, uh, Tom. You know, you turn the lights out in the room, you can find your way back to the keyboard. Oh yeah. So. Uh, well, well anyways, this is uh, this has been very interesting. Uh, one of these days, I'll take three seconds and show you what we're running on this end to get the show to you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you got more than you got. It take more than three seconds. Uh, you know. got a pretty complex well, setup. That's uh, that's looking good, Ted. Uh, man, it's uh takes a lot to do what you do but man it's it, you you making it very professional and first class looks like to me enjoy looking at well, your uh, ham shack here too now we uh you know when you're doing live programming on shortwave the transmitter is about uh 17 miles from our house here and uh, this this studio is in my home it's in the you know in what was a bedroom <laughs> yeah and uh but you know, we're 17 miles from the transmitter, but it's it's hard to put a studio in at a shortwave transmitter site because the RF is so intense it just gets into everything. The only thing I, I just want to add to the folks that, that be sure and call us on field day, uh, we want to hear from everybody. And um, in the past, we've had people pass the phone around. That had, they, they had uh, one amateur at the site that was actually uh, 100 years old. And then they, they let him put him on the air. That was really cool. Um, then they handed the phone to a young ham. I think there was like six or seven that had passed his general ticket. And that was all at, uh, at the same location. I thought that was really neat. So people can pass that cell phone around at their field day locations and let, uh, let folks get on the radio and give their opinion. I think the excitement is firsthand. You know, it, it, that's when the people are experiencing experiencing the excitement is when it, uh, um, you know, and you hear that it's, it's contagious, you know, and, uh, Oh yeah. I get, 
well, cause just, a lot of folks to want to get into the hobby that are sitting on the sidelines. Yeah, uh, had a comment in the chat room said it's been 40 years since I ran an analog board like that. I don't, I'm not sure which one he's talking about, but uh, hey, analog is still good. Hey, I, I hope the uh, field day weather is good this year. I'm sure it will be somewhere. I, I know last year it was uh, it was pretty bad. So uh, you guys, uh, there's there's Ted's number. If you forget it, just go to QSO Radio Show uh, dot com, and I think Ted, you have the number listed there, right? Right, it's up there. The times and everything is okay. there, and then um, you know they can jot it down six one five eight. You can know, remember it really easy. Let me tell you how you remember it. Um, six one five is the area code for Middle Tennessee, Nashville. Yeah. Now what what's a what's a good tube that used to oh, be used? Oh, eight thirteen. I I had an amplifier. I put three eight thirteens in it. There you go. And uh, so, what's the number one hobby in the world? We got zero one is ham radio, and then oh, of course seventy three. <laughs> okay. I, I can I can remember that. that. I can I can definitely remember that. All right, well, we're going to call in sometime after 2 o'clock on Saturday. And, uh, again, that's going to be on 9930 uh, kilohertz for people to tune in. All right. Well, well I'll good. go ahead and say good night. Yeah. I know you're anxious to get this chat room thing going that you guys do. Well, I just, had, say... I just had maybe two more announcements, Ted. I don't know if you've heard this or not, but let me jump into them real quick. Hey, did you know uh, U.S. Navy uh, Marine Corps? Uh, is going to end their the U.S. Navy and Marine Corps is going to end their Mars program by the end of September. Did you know that? I had heard that. Yeah, had, all had the operations that. are going to be transferred over to the other Mars uh, programs. And let's see. Oh, it looks like we might be getting a couple new amateur radio bands. Uh, uh, they're going to be 2,200 meters. Ooh, that's 135 kilohertz, and 630 meters. That's 472 kilohertz. Uh, those frequencies can't be used until the FCC modifies Part 97 rules. Once that happens, uh, we'll be able to operate there. And those frequencies are going to be shared with the unlicensed Part 15 utility companies. Now, these frequencies are mostly used to control the power grids. So the FCC thinks that the hams, you know, we're going to have to have a little separation, and we're going to have to live together and not cause interference with each other. So uh, hopefully you won't live too close to the power grids. Or you're going to be shutting down the power grids. So that was. Uh, uh, I don't know. We we um. I just heard um, um. What did I hear? Well, I heard about this um this storm, but I haven't been able to find anything on it. I, you know, I I was I was looking and reading, but they said something about that we may experience some power grid outages with this storm. It's and, uh, uh, it's been a very severe uh, uh, solar storm, I think, uh, the last day or two, and uh, it's supposed to even be powerful enough to cause some damage. So we'll we'll see how it goes. You know, that's that's another thing that we need to think about, and that is, um, what would happen if um, if we had a solar storm that took out, you know, communication satellites? Boy, that would just be a that'd be terrible, uh, an incredible thing, you know, because so many so many things would stop working. Uh, you know, I'm told that most uh, the teller machines at, at banks would, would close down. I don't know if that's true or not, but at least that's what I've been told. So it's a lot It's a lot to think about. That's why I like to keep my eye on things like solar storms, you know, that uh, what, what could happen. You know? Oh, yeah. Well, I'll go ahead and say right. 73, 73, unless you've got anything else. No, that, that's it, have man. We're going to go to uh, we're going to uh, go to a segment of the show here. Uh, it's, it's a really informal uh, segment. Anybody wants to join us with their camera and microphone, we're going to put you on the webcast. We can take up to ten people at a time. And uh, uh, Kathy, I think sent a link out a few minutes ago. If you click on that link, you'll be able to uh, join us and be on the webcast, and you can wave uh, wave to all your viewers out there. So, uh, 73 I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to do it. Uh, okay, and and, and uh, uh, Dr. Rick says, uh, Dr. Rick, you need a Google Plus account. That's the only problem. Do you have a Google Plus account? No, I don't. Well, you can set one up real quick. It's free, and I think you can do it real quick. It's just go to Google, search for Google Plus, uh, register for a free account. It, it's like a Gmail account almost, but it's I don't know the difference, but it's Google Plus. 
Once you have that, you click on that link and you're on the show with 10 other people and it's a real free for all. Everybody's, uh, uh, after about a few minutes, it kind of settles down and uh, everybody starts seeing how to let the other people talk, you know. So uh, we'll be looking for you, Dr. Rick, uh, to, get, to get on there. So, 73 Ted, thanks a lot, man. Uh, great job tonight. And let me, uh, I just want to say to everybody out there, send us an email if you, uh, have any topics you'd like for us to cover on the show, you know, and if you'd like to uh, be a guest on the show, uh, send us an email, let us know, uh, uh, you know, what interesting uh, things you might have that you'd like to present. We'll uh, see about getting you on the show here. So uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, we're going to go to roundtable. Ted, thank you. Good night. Good night. Talk to you later. All right, so it's going to take me about two minutes to uh, to uh, get on roundtable. I will be back, so you guys don't don't run away. Uh, in the meantime, uh, I'm going to put something on for you here. I'll be right back. Uh, yeah, drop off and then just. Uh, do you see the link? You, you don't see the link, do you? No. Okay. Um, let me send. But okay, let, let me do this, Doctor Rick. Let me do this uh, for you and for for the other people out there too. Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, okay, uh, I just put a link. I don't know if you can copy that link. Can you right click and copy that link? Well, or or you can leave. Yeah, you can if you're on the webcast. Are you in? A, do you see the chat room? You may you may not be in the chat room. You're getting a commercial. Yeah. Okay, that's okay. Um, I clicked on the chat room and it says, uh, it says I had to establish a link and, uh, and yeah. To a new user account and all that kind of stuff. So uh, fill that in, it, fill that in real quick, and yeah, click yeah. click submit and just use that. It'll work. Uh, I don't think you'll have to wait for the code back. It, it'll it will work and allow you in. Oh, okay. All just, right. Just put your uh, put your username and a password in here. See if you can get in the chat room. I'll stand by here with you a second. Yeah. And our Glenn Popel, KW5GP, is in the chat room. And Glenn Popel is the author of the. Glenn Popel is the author of uh, Amateur Radio. No, uh, Arduino for for uh, Amateur Radio is a ARL publication, and he says he's going to take the, take demerits. That he's going to miss roundtable tonight. He's going to leave us now, guys. For, for you guys left in in the. In a video in a chat room, Glenn Popel is leaving us. He's not going to join us tonight. We're going to have to give him some demerits for that. Uh, Dr. Rick, did you get in a chat room yet? Hang on a second. I had too many too many time delayed audio sequences going on there. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah, yeah. You want to turn? Yes, I'm in the chat room now, so I guess I can drop off the. the yeah. uh, I All can right, drop so, off of here, and so, there I am at the bottom, N6 and R. Okay. okay, so stand by just one second. Let me uh, okay. let me send uh, up. Oh, let me send the. Um, oh, gee, let me send this link out again. Uh, okay, this should be the link right here. If you click on that link, and if you if you've got a Google Plus account, you should be able to uh, to get in. So I'm gonna go ahead and sign uh, sign off with you, Dr. Rick, and I'm gonna go over on Google. Uh, Plus to our hangout and see if anybody's there to join us tonight. Okay, and it may not much. be anybody there, but we're gonna try it. So save me three. Okay. All right, uh, we will be right back with you. Don't go away. So you're saying I can ask this cat any question? The cat is connected to the computer. You just type in the question. It will read his mind. You're the man! I've been looking for this for weeks.
Okay, I'm uh, looking for my link to click on here, so I'll have it here in a minute. I don't know why I always have trouble finding this link here. All right, I found it. Uh, let's see what happens here. See if anybody's in there. <clears throat> okay, well, there's no one there. No one there tonight. We'll give it a few minutes to see if anybody wants to join us. Glad everybody uh, joined us tonight on the, the webcast. Uh, I think you uh, probably are like me. Dr. Rick is a, a very interesting person there. He's got a lot of great stories to talk about ham radio and and everything. We'll uh, we'll try to uh, record some things for field day. Maybe have it on the next Tuesday night uh, webcast. Uh, if anybody uh, out there is listening on Shoreway, please send us an email to tom at w5kub.com. We'd love to uh, hear from you. And also, we'd love to hear from anybody else that uh, has uh, topics for the show or would like to be on our show. Just uh, send, us, uh, send us an email. So I know Dr. Rick's going to try to get on the uh, the hangout with us. No, no other takers tonight, guys. Nobody else wants to be on with us. We'll give it another minute or two. Hangout seems a little confusing at the, at the start to uh, create an account and get on Hangout, but uh, after you've done it a couple times, it's it's pretty easy to use. So uh, I think it's uh, a lot of people are a little a little afraid to get on and start uh, uh, start trying to connect that way. All right, well, there's no one here. Um, let me let me do this. I am going to I'm going to call into and I'm going to break into another group that has a Google Plus running. Let's see. I'm going to try to get into another hangout here. Hang on, let's see what's going on here. All right. Hey, hey guys. How you doing? Hi, Tom. What's up? Oh, not too much. We thought we'd run over here real quick. You're on the webcast right now. We didn't have any takers to come on the other one. So uh, yeah, you're more than you're more than welcome here. You know that. Well, you know, but you guys talk about secret stuff on here. Let me, uh, let me. Uh, let Don't me put worry, you we know you're coming. You I guys, heard you coming. You guys talk about secret stuff on here. Uh, and by the way, guys, that's uh, that's Bruce right there, uh, KC2YEJ. He's up in New York. New York. <laughs> uh -huh. 
And then, hey, man, we've got a Canadian friend on here, uh, Mark, up in Canada. Hello. Hey. How's it going? Going pretty good. No camera tonight? Uh, yeah, but uh, I'm in my garage. Oh, okay. We would not want to see that garage, that's for sure. No, no, no. No, it's not a, not a pretty sight. Well, I'm thinking the solar storm has uh, probably cut back on our uh, hangouts here. There's only two here, and there were none over on mine, so it's got to be well, some, was, uh, some answer to it. There was four here before, but they just left. Oh, okay. Okay, John, well, uh, uh, Dr. John, Rick here, he just realized he didn't have a microphone on uh, this computer. Uh, the other one was tied up on, with the call. Okay, <clears throat> well, Dr. Rick tried to get on, but uh, he... Uh, he didn't have a mic, so anyway, Dr. Rick, if you're listening, I'm not on that hangout anymore. No no one was there, so I went over on the old standby hangout with a couple other friends. I know they're always here. They're here 24 hours a day. They don't even eat. Yeah, I'm just fat. Because you can tell I that by looking at these guys. They don't even eat. <laughs> oh, man. So what's up, Tom? What's oh, not on? not too much. Uh, I just uh, fixed the clothes to show down here, and uh, 